Hi, everyone. Great to be here. My name's Chris. I'm a reforming product manager here at Platform9. Been with the company for a number of years. Started off actually leading our OpenStack product. And for a number of years, I led our cloud native solutions, all targeting uh, DevOps as well as Kubernetes. Today, I'm actually going to jump right into one of the biggest problems with leaving existing on-premise virtualization infrastructure, and that's with migrations. The reason we want to start here is this is always the first question we get from anyone we talk to. They say, hey, I'm on VMware. I'm not really happy with what's being communicated to me with some changes coming. And I would like to understand what it's going to take to, to make a move, to make that change. And actually being able to physically move your virtualized infrastructure from VMware to another platform is a big lift. OpenStack is part of our heritage. It's part of how we've built private cloud director. And it's where we thought we could really contribute to the open source community with an open source tool that anyone with OpenStack can use. But it's also part of what we're bringing to market with private cloud director. When we talk about migrations and we think about what challenges exist, there's a, there's a huge variety. Sometimes it's the scale of VMs. Sometimes it's organizations that have really invested in their developer experience. They've built a whole developer platform on top of VMware. They've maybe used Terraform or Ansible. Maybe they've used tooling that's a little bit more VMware aligned with the Arise suite. Maybe teams have very unique driver use cases. Maybe they've got high performance networking and they're concerned about how that's going to transition. Maybe they've just got large amounts of data. Maybe they've just got a need to migrate with the most minimal of downtime. And these are the challenges that we've taken on with the, the tool we've built. Uh, our internal project name for it is called vJailbreak, and it's up on GitHub if you search for that today. And we're actually going to go through a live demonstration. Chris? Yes. The port, what's a port of virtual? Para, what was the, go back to the prior slide. Para virtual device, you're talking about vSAN? Para virtual devices. We're talking about, and Rupak can jump in here. Um, we're talking about devices that are in your environment, maybe pass through. Cases for like Telco, SRV, DBDK, be some of the ones. Your external USB CD ROM drive. Would it would also be like the proprietary drivers for another hypervisor for their storage controller or network controller that might not necessarily work as soon as you migrate that VM to another hypervisor? Oh. I think that's... Good question. Got to roll in the big guns. Yeah, you already answered it, but just for the completeness sake, these are the devices that different hypervisors exposes inside the guest operating system, and they are typically specific to that hypervisor technology. There are frankly, mostly just three in the world right now, or the most popular one. VMware has some, Hyper-V has some, and obviously the open source version that we use, which is KVN and QMU has. So just to be clear, are we talking about vSAN storage? No, it's not just vSAN storage, it is the device that is exposed inside the guest. vSAN storage is the storage system outside of it. So vSAN to me is the equivalent of any other HCI solution from Nutanix and others, or uh, other vendors who provide big RN solutions. So those are all similar. It's, it's a virtual device, Ray, that works with the hypervisor the VM's already on, but all of a sudden you move it to another hypervisor and it won't work. Your storage controller or your network control inside so of it's VM. It's primarily a device driver. It's a device driver, yep. and all of a sudden, you know, they're talking about migrating to another hypervisor, you get the data over there, you get the VM over there, but it won't work because you tried to boot it up. It's like, I don't know how to connect to my storage. I don't know how to connect to the network. So when you, so I guess the question underlying this is, do you support vSAN data migration or how does that work in the of Brian? Yeah, so we will, we'll talk about it and we'll actually show you. We are not migrating, we are migrating the virtual machine and we are converting the virtual desks, which are out there on vSAN into another storage system or whatever you have configured, NFS or iSCSI or whatever fiber channel uh, storage that you have. 
and that would be converted or just copied over. So what my colleague Tane is going to uh, share with us is a migration running from VMware into uh, Platform 9's private cloud director. What we're going to do is migrate an application server that's actually running an e-commerce product. Uh, when I was in the world of pre-sales, I used to use this for demonstrating application performance management problems within .NET applications. So this not commerce has been around for a while. Um, it's a live running shop and we'll show that. What will happen during the migration is we'll move the IP address. We'll do things like QEMU tools installation. We'll update the drivers related question, as well as remove VMware tools. Now, the last piece of this migration that will be uh, shared with us momentarily was a, a bit of a discussion. We're like, what do we do with the database? Do we move it to, or do we leave it in VMware to show that you can actually operate these two environments side by side and still deliver a service to your customers? So the last piece is once that VM migration is finished, the application will start up and it's actually going to go from private cloud director and the application server is going to reach back out to the database that's backing the application. And with that, we will uh, jump into the demonstration. Tane? Yeah. Hi, Tane here with Platform 9. So I'll jump straight into the demonstration. So this is the vCenter environment that we're going to use. We will be migrating this uh, Windows 22 app VM that is running the Knob Commerce application. And this would communicate to the Windows 22 DB server that has um, the database in it. We will be migrating it to um, our PCD uh, private cloud director environment. So this is the environment to which we're going to be migrating it to. And we'll be using the tool vJailbreak. So the UI for it is fairly straightforward. We start off by specifying credentials for uh, your vCenter environment and your OpenStack environment, in this case, which would be our PCD environment. We fill in the server name, the username, uh, the name of the data center to which we are migrating to, and our credentials. We then select the, the credential file for our PCD environment, and this is something you can take straight away from the UI. Once these credentials are val validated, we perform a discovery um, in our environment, and we populate a list of virtual machines that you can migrate. So I will be migrating the application VM, and we, we do support uh, migrating multiple VMs at the same time together. So for demonstration purposes, I will select another uh, Windows 22 server VM, and we'll migrate both of these parallelly together at the same time. Now, we need to specify mappings between storages and networks in both environments. So we need to select, we, we give you a list of networks that are existing in both of, in all of the virtual machines that you've selected. And we allow you to select an equivalent OpenStack network in your environment. These networks are something you would have to pre-create along with subnets and specific, um, specific configurations that may be needed for that network. Once you configure that, it would appear in the list over here, and you can select it. There is no naming convention or, um, or specification that's required. You can map any network in VMware to any network in OpenStack. Similarly, we have to map the storages. So you would select the data store that your VMs are running on in vCenter, and you would map it to an equivalent volume type um, in OpenStack. After this, we provide some Just a question on on the interface there. The decision you've exposed that it is an OpenStack volume type. Yes. Why? Why is, is that necessary to know? It is so. Sometimes you can have different backends uh, in your environment. They could be for different types of storages. You could be using NFS, or you could be using some other storage driver. So you would map these to a different volume type. So you could decide. For example, let's say you want your operating system to be on a faster, um, on a faster volume type or on a faster um, data data store in the backend. So you could map that uh, to specifically that um, faster storage, and you could map, let's say, uh, data storage to a slower volume type. So it allows you flexibility in configuring your environment. 
Oh, I see. Because you support multiple backends. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of different technologies. Right, going right. So OpenStack is one, Kubernetes is another. So that you expose that so that you can actually make choice as an operator for the environment. Right. Okay. Is the, is so the this, Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, so, so this is targeted at a essentially a someone who is familiar with those backend choices rather than a necessarily a front end application person managing their app. It's it's much more for that infrastructure team. Right. Yes. Yep. Right. Sorry, you had a question as well? No, he took my question because that's what he does. What what happens with respect to <laughs> way ahead of you, man? <laughs> what happens with respect to data platform? object storage solutions, stuff like that. Can you migrate those over to OpenStack? Or is, you know, oh. Cloudian, MinIO, those? So we migrate whatever contents you have in the VM. Um, they could be like application specific or they could be database specific. We migrate basically the entire contents, contents of the disk over. Yeah, it's just not clear to me how the object storage plays out in VMware. Well, people don't use Object storage to store the VM itself, right? But they might map it inside the VM, and I suspect that wouldn't change. You migrate the VM as long as you have the proper network and access set up in the destination platform, then you're good to go. I think that um, the important part is, is this network configuration, because you said that you need to prepare it before the start uh, of the migration. If there is uh, any possibility of assess uh, existing uh, network setup and then you know, if it's uh, recreated on the target environment, just then to choose from it. Yeah. Right. So there is a lot of flexibility in how networks can be configured, and OpenStack does allow you to configure some additional stuff as well. So um, that is something that we'll, we are working on. It's in our roadmap, but um, you would right now need to have the networks be configured. So an admin would need to mm -hmm. go into your environment and replicate what you have set up in VMware. Right. Thank you. Uh, going back to the S3 question, like MinIO or other object storage, uh, I think that, that, again, the question was answered, but just for the I'll I, I, I repeat that. <laughs> uh, S3 database connections, they are just other services which are configured as part of the virtual machine. So when the virtual machine moves, as long as the network configuration is right, they will continue to work. In fact, in this demo, we are going to show that we are only moving the application server, the database server remains in the old network on some VLAN segment, and because we are able to recreate the network onto private cloud director, the communication continues. And, and this is really important because there are thousands of virtual machines that you need to migrate. So you're not going to do it in one day. So in that environment, you're using the storage solution that's still on VMware uh, and connecting it to your server, which is running on OpenStack. Right. Or your VM running on OpenStack. It may not be a storage solution running in the in in the VM where it may be another database. service on Kubernetes or Anything. other service. Yes. Correct. Yeah. We also persist Macs and IPs of your of your VM. So that enables services to run as they were running in VMware. Um, finally, I'll just go over the additional options that we have. So we perform two steps for the migration. We first copy the VM over, then we perform incremental live updates on the VM, um, and then we perform migration for it. Um, so we allow you to specify whether you would like to cold migrate the VM or you would like to warm migrate the VM, as in you migrate the VM, you copy the data of the VM over while the, your application is still running. So this allows you to transfer your data into OpenStack with uninterrupted, so with your service being uninterrupted. Um, so is that, so essentially you're doing the equivalent of a vMotion of the data? Yeah, we use VMware's change block tracking feature in order to support this. Yep. So would that enable, like, basically bulk migrations where I want to move a bunch of VMs, I want to minimize the outage, so right. I'm going to wait until I have most of the data there and then schedule a cutover and just migrate exactly. the last bit of data for however many VMs. Exactly, okay. 100%. So we allow you to configure that. Maybe you would like to perform a cold migration just for the sake of uh, a quicker migration, uh, but we allow you to configure that in data copy methods. Um, and then as you mentioned for cutover, you would use your cutover window. We, we allow you to specify a couple of cutover options when you can cut over immediately after the data copy. You can schedule a window, uh, which would be typically your downtime window. So let's say you have 12 to 12 or 12 to six um, is your downtime window. You can specify that I want my 
the VM to cut over sometime within this window. And if it doesn't cut over, don't interrupt my running, my running VM. You can specify your window over here and you can And you can also specify, you can have an admin specified cutover where the data would copy over, but you would only turn off your source VM when your admin makes, uh, does a manual intervention and manually specifies that, yes, start my cutover process now. Um, we also allow you to inject a post migration script where you can say, after my VM migrates, execute so, so, and so to maybe perform validations or restart some services or perform checks anything your application may need. And finally, we allow you to retry migrations on in case of failure. So maybe you have a little bit of leeway um, in case of a failure. You would like it to retry it once more. And in case it doesn't fail after retry, then, you know, then it needs an admin to go and check physically like what was wrong in that setup. So we allow you to configure that. For now, I leave all of these options unchecked. This would mean your the data copy would start immediately and the migration would start uh, the cutover will start immediately after the data copy finishes. Can I ask a question regarding cutover? Uh, this admin uh, integrate, inter integration, um, right. it means that the admin just power off the VM or he needs to do some additional steps, run some script inside the VM. How this uh, cutover is uh, treated that it's done by admin? Um, we would show you a status. Mm -hmm. um, I, after I schedule this VM, you will see we have a dashboard that shows you, maybe let me just schedule this. Yes. So we would update the status over here along with individual phases at which the migration is at. So the admin can see where and what phase it is at. And in case it fails, you can also see which phase specifically it failed at for further debugging. Yes, but uh, I, I assume that till the moment that the cutover is done, mm -hmm. uh, the target VM that is created on the OpenStack site, on right. the AVM site, uh, it's uh, still receiving the blocks, right? Because the change block tracking is still working and it's sending right. the blocks of data to the target VM. We do not create the target VM until we have completely copied over the data along with the blocks. So the way how we do it is we jailbreak runs in a, in a virtual machine, essentially, essentially. And we attach the volumes that we are migrating to to this virtual machine. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a target instance setup, but we use this instance itself to copy all the blocks over. And the jailbreak is also scalable. So you could scale this out to, you just deploy another, let's say 10 or so v jailbreak VMs. They would all connect to each other and you would then be able to schedule tens or hundreds of migrations together, limited on your uh, physical storage. bandwidth mm -hmm. or storage capacity. So this is the domain on which um, the application is running. I will um, just buy an item. Um, it's a little slow, so bear with me. I will purchase, let's see. I'm just purchasing the first item that I see on the list over here. The reason we're doing this, this is today's going through the uh, buying process, is to show that that change black tracking is capturing interactions with the application in real time, right? It's always good to show, uh, you know, hey, we're migrating a VM. Here it is, moved A to B. We wanted to get a little bit closer to the real world for the people that are dialing in today or watching this as a replay to show that it truly is able to track and keep up to date with, you know, changes in the back, back mm -hmm. end infrastructure uh, to really help minimize. Do you... Um pause the VM, you know, by uh, this mechanism of Windows that you can pause the VM for the moment of uh, switch over to not lose any uh, consistency of data. Or you just uh, don't use it. It's VSS, I, f I think, the shortcut for it. Shadow uh, copy. Or you're just using the traditional, let's say, snapshotting. And yes, we're using the traditional snapshotting technique. Okay. 